The algorithms that allow us to reveal your intimate traits and psychological profile, one of the powerful applications of such algorithms is to target you with marketing messages and tailor those messages to make them most interesting and most relevant to, uh, to you as an individual. Now, one of the marketing types of marketing that is heavily employing uh, such approaches is political marketing. And in fact, Barack Obama was one of the first politicians that started using algorithms of this kind on a massive scale. And now it's kind of a fact of, uh, it's, a, uh, it's a fact of life that politicians will use micro-targeting of their political messages to uh, reach out to the voters. Naturally, people are concerned about it, but my personal opinion is that people are concerned about um, the wrong part of the story here. So just the sheer fact that you can target people with relevant messages, messages that are matched to their interests, fears, dreams, personalities, and so on, is a very good thing. That is an equivalent of a politician coming to your household, talking with, get, taking time to get to know each one of the members of your household, and then trying to explain to them, hey, you, you see, my program, this part of my program, or that part of my program, will help you to you know, realize your dreams and, uh, uh, and prevent the bad things that you fear from happening, right? which is an amazing thing. It keeps the message more relevant to people. It keeps people more interested uh, in the message. And it also makes people more competent to judge the quality of such message, which is great for a democratic process. We are having more engaged, more interested voters uh, that are being talked to about things that are important and relevant to them. So just great news for democracy, I believe. Also, it has many other you know, consequences that are very often overlooked. If I can target voters with my message in an accurate way, I basically can stop you know, broadcasting just generic messages using TVs and you know, expensive ads in newspapers, which basically means that political dialogue between politicians and voters became much cheaper. I can reach the voters using way cheaper means such as Facebook uh, marketing targeting or adverts or tweets and adverts or adverts sent in other environments which again has an amazing effect of decreasing the reliance of politicians on big money. If you can be talking to voters at a fraction of a cost that you needed 10 or 20 years ago, it means that you also have much less debts to pay to big industry and, and, and other uh, potentially very influential players on the market. So it's great news and we had at least two big examples of that happening in recent election. We had Bernie Sanders and Donald Trump, who both were not the part of establishment. They both didn't have much experience in, uh, in politics, really, or kind of uh, running for president politics. And also they have had very small funds compared with funds that you know, some other mainstream politicians like Jeb Bush or Hillary Clinton had, and yet, they were able to energize great numbers of voters and in the case of one of them, win the election, right? Another, I think, consequence of micro-targeting in political messaging that people are often overlooking is that because you are not limited to broadcasting generic messages and you can now micro-target messages to make them interesting and relevant to people, what happens is that now it makes sense to reach out to the voters that were previously excluded from the political dialogue because maybe you know, it didn't make an economic sense to try to target them with your broadcasted message. And again, we can see that with both Trump and Sanders energizing types of electorate that was not really energized before. The larger the fraction of the society that we bring in to the political process, uh, the better for democracy. Now, having said that, you can use the very same political uh, message targeting to 
let's say, dis uh, discourage people from voting. And we have seen this in last election as well, where you could see very well-targeted messages uh, aimed at the electorate of your opponent to try to discourage them from casting the vote. And now this is an awful um, use of such technology. But again, instead of focusing on trying to you know, blame the technology for this thing happening, we should rather kind of, technology is just a medium here. We should just focus on the phenomenon itself. We should perhaps start discussing whether it's okay to allow for negative marketing in politics. And by the way, there are countries that free Western uh, democracies where negative, target, negative marketing in politics is basically not acceptable or even illegal. Human history is a history of great change, full stop. We were always living through great changes, it's just that recently uh, the speed of progress has accelerated, so we have a great change you know, every couple months or every couple years. But we also have a lot of evidence from the history showing that humanity basically adjusts their behavior uh, and figures out how to avoid the downsides and employ the upsides of a given great change. You know, and you know, starting from in the agriculture through industrial revolution, and then something perhaps more relevant to uh, the subject of this conversation, which is explosion of marketing. You know, when you had first uh, billboards on the roads or first large format ads in newspapers, people were also discussing, you know, the end. It was, you know, seen as, you know, the end of the world as we know it and now everyone will be manipulated and the world will be just handed over to marketers who will be just running it. And, you know, we kind of know that it just did not happen. Partly because people developed an immune system, immunity to those ads. And now I think that the same will happen with digital marketing. You know, you probably already stopped noticing adverts on the websites. Your brain learned, you know, it's just not worth looking at. Uh, not to mention that now we have technology that ads blockers that just basically explicitly remove those ads uh, from, uh, from your online experience. Now, obviously, co the, the progress uh, is a never-ending race. So once we learn how to avoid being swayed uh, too much by, uh, by online ads, the companies are just developing new ways of, uh, uh, of manipulating or influencing us. And a good example is uh, related to how sharing of inf how newsfeed on Facebook works. So people don't realize that when they see a story that is shared by their friend, the fact that they see a story is a product of both friends sharing the story, but also the company behind the story, the outlet behind the story, paying Facebook money for this given story being shown on your newsfeed, right? So people don't really realize, that people think, oh, it's just my friend sharing a story, and what I can see here on my newsfeed is a representative representation of what my friends are talking about. In fact, it's not. It's a product of what your friends are talking about and how much money a given company behind a given story was willing to pay Facebook to promote it. And I think that people don't realize it now, but with time, we'll just adjust our perception uh, to this phenomenon as we adjusted our perception to phenomena of the, of the past. Mm -hmm.